everyone. Thank you all for the invitation and for um, making the time to hear about this work. Um, if you could go ahead and hit the next slide, because of course we're going to talk a little bit about technology, which means the technology is not working perfectly. Um, so what I wanted to do was actually um, uh, present the group with the overarching frame that in which within which all of our work actually is situated. I will talk about four principles for digitized data in civil society. Um, and we can spend as much time as you like on those. Um, I will also say that over the last two years in particular, the use of the word phrase data ethics um, <clears throat> outside of the academy, where inside of the academy, there's been some substance to that phrase for a good amount of time, not always followed, not always implemented, but there's been some meaning to research ethics and data ethics. But out in the wild, particularly in the last two years, as the general public has become more and more aware of the way um, digital data uh, is monetized and commercialized, data ethics as a frame, um, I believe, has become not just meaningless. In fact, it's not meaningless. It has a very specific meaning in the wild. It means, please do not regulate the companies. And I'm not in favor of that definition, so I don't use the term anymore. <laughs> so I, I, I don't, I won't, um, I put, that's one point. Point number two is, I think ethics are getting a short shrift these days because we're throwing the terminology around without wanting to invest the time in the philosophical traditions that usually inform a, a set of ethical principles or the different ethical frameworks. Or, you know, we think ethics kind of means being good, not bad. And I don't, so I, I'm trying to stay away. I'm actually trying to talk about some things that I think have uh, um, some deeper meanings. They don't, they don't have a catchy catchphrase to them, but um, I try to go back to some first principles. The other reason I want to frame this up front like that is because you all work in di very different cultural contexts. Where you're spread around the world. Your understanding and, and your engagement with philanthropy and civil society may involve a whole set of dynamics between political entities that isn't the same place that I come from. And so I don't want to, um, you know, there can also be kind of ethical colonialism. Um, I don't think, in, in other, all this is by way of saying there isn't one way to do this. There isn't one way to be cautious and respectful and responsible with digitized data. So I'm not trying to pretend that there is. But I do hope that what I'll say has some resonance for you and may um, provide you perhaps with, in a, in a sense, some steps to go backward in your work before going forward. And by backward, I mean, ask yourself and your clients and your colleagues and your members or whoever it is you're working with how to lead a conversation with them that allows for the creation of a set of practices that has integrity in your context. Um, the slide you're looking at now, I run something at Stanford. I founded something called the Digital Civil Society Lab. So this is the definition we use. Um, this is what we're talking about. And you all can look at this definition and immediately recognize that if you took the last four words off, it's actually, a, 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 there's nothing new in the definition of civil society. Um, if you'd go to the next slide, um, so my first argument that I have to make for people is why does the in the digital age part matter? Um, because this isn't really about just having a Twitter account. Um, there's got to be something more meaningful about the digital. And I want to start with that at least. Well, first I want to start with democracy and then I want to start with um, what's meaningful about digital. So you've probably seen something like this over the years, over your own studies. You know, there is an understanding or at least um, an, an explicit understanding, uh, an implicit understanding, excuse me, about the relationship or the existence, I should say the existence of these three different sectors in modern democracies, liberal and otherwise. Um, this picture makes it look like they're actually separate. Um, it's a bad picture. I need to stop using it. They're not separate. They touch, they interact, they interweave, and they do so in very different ways in very different cultural contexts. Um, 
different governments, different societies have these three pieces in, in different amounts, if you will. Um, but the, what I want to draw your attention to, because it informs the creation of the principles, is there is a sense both in political theory, um, and not only Western political theory, but mostly Western political theory, um, and in the history of Western liberal democracies, which again is the space in which I sit, of not just the existence of these three spaces, but their distinct roles um, and the sense that uh, civil society, however you define it, and whatever is actually in there, is among other things responsible for doing uh, two things that keep democracy standing. One is it is the place where in a system in which the majority theoretically runs the government, and yes, United States of America, I'm looking at you, that's theory, not practice, um, where the majority of voters elect the representative government, you need a space, and this is where civil society fits in, you need a space where the rest of the people can express themselves and associate and pursue their particular uh, quote unquote minority interests um, without needing to resort to revolution. So there's, there's, that, um, there's that pressure valve role of civil society. And then there's also the fact that um, there will be in any society multiple minorities with multiple interests and rights. And that civil society plays an important role of being a place where we actively um, uh, not just respect, but protect and sustain and celebrate, if you will, the rights of multiple minority groups in whatever society you're talking about. So in a majority run system, civil society plays at least those two very important roles. And in order to do that, some forms of independence are important, independence from the other two sectors. And I'll come back to this because essentially the Digital Civil Society Lab was set up and our overarching hypothesis is in the current moment, in the digital age, there is no such independence. And so it's not at all surprising, if you agree with us, that democracy, modern Western liberal democracies are struggling right now because they're structurally unsound. And I'll explain what I mean by that. And again, all of this is toward informing the set of principles we try to um, inculcate about using digitized data. If you go to the next slide, um, this picture also um, is, uh, this is from the United Kingdom. Uh, the Civil Society Futures Group drew this picture a year ago. And I put it here, you're all probably quite familiar with this, not, um, not stuck in an old mindset that civil society is some dyadic relationship between charities and, and philanthropy, but I like to just remind us of that. It's a messy space. There's a lot going on in it. There's, um, this may not be relevant, uh, you know, an exact picture of your context. Again, this was drawn in the UK through a series of community conversations over two years, I believe. But I found that in most places I visit, um, there are pieces of it that are resonant. The size of the bubbles might be different, um, but what's important is the complexity and uh, the variation and um, when I look at this picture, and I'm mostly talking now, so you'll take a moment to look at it, I can actually also identify a number of things that are not here um, in, in meaningful ways, or certainly in the U.S. context, the, um, the bubbles would be differently sized. But I want to also make the point that the space we're talking about from an, from an organizational um, institutional perspective is very diverse and very dynamic. Um, if you go to the next slide, you may have seen this. This comes from the Urban Institute point here. We also are not just giving charitably. And I apologize, the resolution of this graphic on the slide is pretty crummy. Um, if, uh, I think you'll get the slides and you can actually download this graphic directly from uh, the Urban Institute, the um, URL. Actually, it's not on the bottom, but it's at the Urban Institute website. Um, this is an important graphic. Now, it's U.S. specific, so um, take it with a grain of salt for your own 
um, context. A uh, couple of things, and it's also, you know, you'll immediately notice they've got hard numbers mixed up with percentages and the categories are a little fuzzy and I've got a lot of problems with this graphic, but again, it makes the point, this is not just about charitable giving or foundations uh, and not-for-profit organizations. If you take this picture and the previous picture, you got two very crowded sandboxes. Um, I can talk about this picture all day, depending on who I'm talking to. Um, I'm happy to come back to it. I will just say, I think for this group, for people who are data enthusiasts and researchers and academics working with philanthropists, one of the really important things to think about as you as you take a close look at these different um, types of giving um, that are represented here is the degree to which we have no access to the data about some of these bullets. So for example, on the right hand side in the light blue color, the third one from the top, uh, it says point of sale donations, $441 million, and it credits that number to an organization called Engage for Good. Yeah, thank you for scrolling in there. Um, and it's a 2016 number. But I know from um, my own research, as well as from checking with that particular data point, that that, first of all, Engage for Good is a um, an organization that promotes point of sale donations. So this is market research, not academic research. Secondly, it's um, drawn from a subset of the number of uh, uh, existing pl platforms by which you would measure point of sale donations. So point of sale donations by the, are, you know, you go to the cashier or you go to a restaurant or you go to an, a retail outlet and they ask you to make a donation for X or Y or Z, right? They, um, you round up your bill, you add a dollar, something like that. And the money moves primarily through commercial partnerships. Eventually, we hope, we think, to some kind of social reproductive enterprise. But if anybody anybody here has ever tried to actually track that money, you know it's a rabbit warren at best. Um, and uh, so my point to you as you look at these kind of presentations is to think about how much of these structural offerings that people are now using to do their giving, we as researchers have actually no access to that data. Now, I know some of you are coming, I mean, if you use the US as a baseline, we tend to say, oh my God, there's the Foundation Center and there's GuideStar and there's the 990s and we have so much access to the data about giving. Not in this context, we certainly don't, because that giving is a tiny piece of this whole picture. And the other ones are almost all being run on proprietary platforms that have no interest in sharing that data with us. They just want you to tell you things like Facebook moved a billion dollars last year to charity. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't believe anything that Facebook tells me. So there's, there's no way I'm going to believe that number. And as a, as a society, we have no way to access that information. That is a big change. Um, it's a big change in the U.S. It may seem like more of the same in other places, but it's a big change. Those are proprietary platforms. There's no political pressure that I'm aware of to actually get that information to be available. And so we are more and more actually um, just playing in the dark collectively. Um, so that's the point I'll make about this slide for this group. If you'd move, so those are the two, those three slides positioning it in the context of democracy and, and some pursuit of independence, um, and the very dynamic and multifaceted nature of how philanthropy and giving and using money to make change in the world is really happening. Again, neither this picture nor the previous one may pr actually represent your context, but I bet your context is as complicated as the last two slides, is where I want to start you. Now, if we, the next two slides, the next couple of slides, um, I want to make a case about data. Um, and most make a case about digitization. Um, and I often use the metaphor of H2O because what, what we're really all grappling with is not so much the nature of data. We, you all have been using data for 
forever in your work. Um, what we're dealing with and grappling with and our colleagues and our clients and our members are dealing and grappling with is the nature of digitization. It's not data, it's digitization. And digitization fundamentally changes the economic nature of the resource. So information is information, whether it's held in pen and paper, in a PDF, or in a machine-readable um, online network database. But think of that, it's the same information. It's going to still be H2O, if we use water as the metaphor. But in the, um, in the pen and paper version of it, it's like an ice cube. You can actually kind of hold it in your hand. You can lock it up in your file cabinet. And you can lock your office door and you can walk away. You can secure it in ways that we're very familiar with. Um, and you can control access to it in ways that we're very familiar with. In a PDF form, let's say, in an online PDF form, um, and the example that's on the bottom of the slide is actually the US tax form 990, it becomes a little bit more like water. It's more liquid. You need different ways of managing it. So you could no longer lock it up. I mean, you could put the glass of water in your file cabinet, lock the thing and lock the door, but it's a little bit, anyway, the metaphor falls apart, but I hope you're following what I'm saying. Um, it's the same information. It's changed form. You need a new way of holding it. At this point, if, I, if you could see me or if we were in a room together, I would be holding a glass of water in my hand and I'd say to the group, the glass here is the equivalent of your foundation or nonprofit organizational structure. It's literally a vessel for holding information in this form. But what's happened is we now live in a world where it's not just a PDF online. It's actually machine-readable data in network context. And machine-readable means you can mix and match it. You can take information from this you know, record and mix it with information from a whole different data set. And you don't have to be anywhere near the organization that put the information out there. You could be anyone. So it's much more, in the water metaphor, it becomes much more like steam. It can be used. It can be very powerful. Um, but it has to be managed and captured and directed the way we have directed steam throughout the industrial age to actually become an energy source. Otherwise, it's just dissipated. It just gets lost. And the metaphor holds here because most of the data, most of the digitized data that nonprofits and foundations, and I'm using that as a shorthand for civil society and funders, are using, are directly generating, um, is lost. It's it's just it's just lost energy, and it also depletes. Then, as you know, when water evaporates, it depletes the knowledge store when you lose it like that. So, we're not set up structurally as a field, as a set of institutions to make good use of this resource. We are losing most of the value. Um, and that what we're holding on to is actually, for the most part, liabilities, not assets. Because, and I'll talk about this, as it gets to sort of the role of foundations in this whole mix. I make this argument all the time directly to foundation executives. They are, in fact, more likely to be a part of the problem when it comes to an appropriate and responsible use of data, digitized data in this system today, they're more likely a part of the problem than a part of the solution. Um, and I'll say what I mean about that now, because I'll probably say it four more times in this thing. Most foundations are busy demanding their nonprofits, their grantees, collect all kinds of very granular information on people, on people, and then report it up the chain to the funder, where we know when we're honest with ourselves that the funders don't do a whole lot with that information. But more importantly, they're making the nonprofits collect this information, but they're not supporting them to do it responsibly or securely, which means they're collecting a whole bunch of information on vulnerable people, because let's assume that that's who the nonprofits are working with. And they're actually making those people more vulnerable by 
pooling all their information in insecure and irresponsible ways, and then having that information transmitted up to a foundation that more often than not doesn't do anything with it. That is really counterproductive, to say the very least. I could call it a whole lot of other things, but I'll just call it counterproductive for now. Um, and so we need to think about that as, as a group that describes itself the way you do. I think there's a, a role to play, a very important role to play, in both making that dynamic understood and finding ways to intervene in it, because we are um, we're, we're sort of shooting ourselves in the foot, to use a lousy phrase. Um, uh, one more slide, please, the next one. The other thing to be very clear about with your own work and in, in the work you do with your partners is that civil society is no longer, and this slide is trying to get at why we're no longer independent. We're no longer independent because all of this digitized information exists on platforms, in software, on hardware, and on networks that are commercially owned and government surveilled. So if you think back to the slide with the three little circles of civil society, markets, and government, we are actually literally operating in their, on their systems. They are the landlords for the entire sector. Everything you do on your computer, your laptop, your iPad, your cell phone, your networked printer happens on equipment and on, on their machinery in their, that they own and surveil. So, and it doesn't mean it matter if you have a Twitter account or not. This is the real shift here. We are playing in their house. The commercial sector and governments are our landlords for everything we do. And I mean that, everything we do. If you have a cell phone, if you have a laptop, if you, if you have this conversation, we are having it on systems that are owned and surveilled, and we're leaving a copy of it. In, we're creating a copy and leaving a copy in real time. So that's why this is so transformative for democracy and not in a good way, the last two points. Um, let me stop there for a second and see if anyone wants to argue with me or wants clarification on those points, because that's really the framework for why we need to be thinking about digital civil society and what we need and why we need to think about how we're going to get it back. Hi, hi, this is Sarah from Wings. Wings. You can, you can unmute yourself, yourself by going next to your name and just clicking on mute if you have a question. You can also raise your hand and then we can call on you if there's any comments at this point. And if there aren't, I'll just keep going, but... <coughs> Okay, I'll assume there aren't. Um, and if you go to the next slide, then Sarah. So that's those are the that that's the whole system. Now I wanted to sort of focus in a little bit, um, and I've got questions on each of the next couple of slides, which we can um, try to address now, or we can come back later um, to them. I meant to pull them all out at the end, but I didn't have a chance to do that. So that's that's the large system what I've just described. It's why the nature of digitized data is different and matters and why the nature of these um, commercial government relationships, which we, I believe, are completely dependent upon um, and, and not paying enough attention to, are so transformative in a really large scale. But I wanted to also um, dig into, sorry, dig into some slightly more specific areas, no doubt things you're thinking about. One is, um, and this is happening around the world, it's happening, it's, it's commonplace in our interaction with commercial platforms, and it's increasingly commonplace in the way government bodies are making decisions, um, which is that they are no longer decisions, and they, they actually haven't been for a long time, but this is now probably really hedging toward the majority of decision making that's happening within regulatory bodies um, and 
and implementing agencies, the decisions, the choices about who gets services and who doesn't, or what allocation, what funds get allocated where, or um, who is watched more closely than other people, those decisions are made by a combination of human behavior and decision making and the use of algorithmic analysis of large data sets, what you hear nowadays mistakenly but repeatedly referred to as AI or machine learning or predictive algorithms, some combination of those terms. But in general, what, what matters here is that you have people and machines working together to make allocation decisions about people's lives and resources. And remember, I'm trying to position this in democracies. And in democracies, one of the things you're supposed to be able to do is understand how decisions are made, <laughs> to scrutinize the way the people you elect to represent you make decisions. And that is becoming increasingly difficult to do, to actually understand what's going on there. So I wanted to put this in front of your the group in case you may be in a position where you're talking to members or uh, constituent foundations or, or whatever who are interested in, you know, how do we use AI in our work? How do we, um, uh, how are fundraisers, the Chronicle of Philanthropy, for example, just did a huge story, uh, several stories on how fundraisers are using AI. But I want to, again, taking this down to first principles, um, and we can talk about this now, we can talk about it later, we can talk about it in the context of how foundations and nonprofits can use this combination of human decision making and machine based decision making together. Um, I think writ large, the bigger substantive change for the sector is the fact that public systems are making decisions this way. So a practical example of how that matters if you're working with funders or directly with organizations who are doing something like um, job training or economic development or who are focused on issues of income inequality, understanding the ways in which either public job training, employment development, economic development, any of that is actually happening requires understanding that it's not just people making those decisions anymore, nor is it human systems. You can't sunshine or freedom of information act the insides of an algorithm. So how do you actually understand how the system is working so that you can try to change it? Or how do you understand how the system is working so that you can help the people being directly affected by the decision that was made about allocation of health care? That's a U.S. context because other places actually provide it to everybody, but we don't. So um, those kinds of choices, all of that is now a combination of these two systems. And we're not well positioned, I would argue, we, the civil society, to really either adapt our service provision to account for this reality and or say, you know, here's the line at which doing this ceases to be democratic or ceases to be humane or here's where you shouldn't be or it's discriminatory or whatever. Um, the EU, I know there are a number of people on the call from the EU, you've got a um, whole different set of rights about this than the rest of the world does. Um, and some of those rights are actually going to be really hard to protect because some of these, com not just the combination of human and machine, but just the way the machine itself, the way the algorithm and the data work together are very hard to explain. So while you have a right to explainability, you may not have the capacity to explain it. Um, so that's another way in which at a closer to ground level action, this world we're living in, I think directly touches on the work you may be doing.
So I've put some questions on the slide. Um, these are questions for discussion. We can talk about them now. We can talk about them later. I do think since the first word in your group's name is researchers, thinking about the question about how do you explain your methods to not just your academic and scholarly colleagues with whom you probably you know can have all day long seminars on your methods and you should be, um, but to philanthropy or your nonprofit partners or the people they serve um, is a question I'm quite interested in hearing your thoughts on. Um, are people more comfortable waiting to say questions to the end? I'll take that as a yes. Let's keep going. <laughs> we have time at the end for questions. I, I mean, silence is, is whatever it is. Let's go to the next one. So that's cluster number one. Cluster number two, you know this, right? This is actually part of why digital network data uh, works like steam. But it, every time you touch digitized information, you generate more digitized information. Um, in this context, context of this group, one of the reasons, one of this, this, this sets up a whole set of dynamics, I think, about um, when you're doing work, say, on a group of foundations, or if you're building a, a data set about civil society in your region of the world, and you're collecting data from those organizations, the, the organizational boundaries become very porous as digitized data moves through them. And by that, I mean, it's not just that you're asking people to report to you digitally or, you're, or, or something like that, but it's that um, they're going to collect data. That generates more data. They're going to share data. That generates more data. They're going to, you're going to have a data set. You're going to interact with that data set. That generates more data. Um, it just it's a, it just keeps growing, and um, it both reinforces the question I raised earlier, or the reality I raised earlier about the fact that I think funders are a big part of the data problem here. But it also is why you will hear people say, and I agree with this, that the notice and consent regime is broken, and by that. You may know what I mean, but since I can't see you, I'll explain it. Um, we have operated in the US and in most of the online platforms and in most of the networked world for almost 20 years now with this idea that if you hand somebody a 28 page, nine point font terms of agreement that you know they're not going to read and you put a big agree button on it, you have met your compliance rule about like, obligations about how you're using their data. So that's the notice and consent. That is the way in which most of us interact with all software, from everything you've put on your cell phone to everything you use at work to everything you interact with out in the wild. And notice and consent, at best, even when it's done well, and it can be done well, although none of the examples I just gave are good examples, but it can be done well, you accounts for the first collection of data. So it says to you, we're going to collect your accelerometer data and I'll, um, from your phone. And in a way that you say, oh, OK, I understand that. And I know what you're doing with it. It's medical research on Parkinson's. OK, I agree. I'm OK with that. I understand this data is going from me to you, and you're using it for this purpose. That doesn't actually account for the very first analysis of that digital data set, let alone how that data set might be shared with someone else. And if you scale that up, you realize that the notice and consent process is just broken. Um, so that's a big deal. We need a whole different kind of permission process, if you will. Um, this is very important because when I get to the principles, you're going to see permission is one of the first ones. So that's that's another part of data that we need to understand. If you go to the next slide, um, 
um, a lot of what we think we can learn from digitized data, and a lot of what we probably can learn from digitized data, a lot of the research that some of the folks on this call might want to do, a lot of the research that some of the foundations that are members of your organizations might want to do, actually involves using data that comes from different sectors. Not even It's not even all just civil society data. And that requires, I think, careful consideration of what kinds of permission the people represented in that data might have given for doing that and what you're ultimately going to try to be learning. So that's point number one here. Point number two, um, and I can come back to this, is because of this reality that digitized data moves so quickly and easily between and across our existing institutional forms, and because of what I said earlier about how you can't use a glass to hold steam, we're not going to see new forms of civil society institutions emerge. They're already among us. They already exist. They're being data trusts, as an example, are being built, started, promoted um, in most countries I've visited in the last two years, so that doesn't include a lot of countries in Africa, but it gets to almost everywhere else. And, um, you know, we don't even have a standard definition of what they are. We're very much in that explosive creation stage where anybody can slap the label data trust on something and claim it's a data trust. So that's happening, and, and we need to be aware of that. And we also, I think, need to be part of those conversations about what those things should be and how they should be structured. The not-for-profit organization that exists in your country, just like the 501c3 uh, charitable nonprofit that exists in the United States, is a man-made form. We created it, we wrote it into law, we set up the privileges around it, we made it up, it's invented. And that's what's happening right now. That happened mostly in the U.S. in the 1870s, and we're going through that same thing right now, and it's our job to really, I think, not just understand it, but inform it. So that's another thing that's going on. If you go to the next slide, um, uh, the whole nature of ownership is complicated in this world. Um, I say to folks all the time, if you look at your own cell phone, you probably think you own those photographs that are on it. In reality, you probably don't, and in fact, you gave away that ownership, but you don't realize it, and you still think they're yours. So our our understanding of ownership is very strange. Um, I think for researchers, um, this is very brass tacks um, meaning. How are you negotiating control and access to the data you're collecting, particularly when and if you're collecting it on behalf of a uh, a client, a, a you know, a set of nonprofits, a set of foundations. Um, for those of you who work at uh, what I think are still called philanthropy support organizations, I think there's a lot of questions here about data that might be held in common, not just for philanthropy research, but also for philanthropy policy. So back to that picture I showed you earlier where um, all the data from the social media platforms and the crowdfunding companies and the point of sale donations, we don't have access to any of that data, yet it's potentially quite informative about how people are actually participating in, in their societies. Should some of that, I mean, should we have a public right to some of that? I mean, you know, we pass laws, that is why the Foundation Center exists. We passed laws that made 990s things that GuideStar could use, that, that's all regulated and incentivized and was driven in part by the sector itself and in part, you know, by the sector versus regulators. But there's, my point being, a whole lot of data out there that could be very useful for research to really understand how people behave. We don't have access to a whole lot of it. What are we going to do about it? That is the easy way to ask the question. Next slide. Um, Last point, um, because we're basically all connected on these systems, all of us, and I mean all of us, all of us together here, all of us in governments, all of us in marketplaces, we're all playing in the same, um, you know, mysterious ether 
and recent, uh, you know, democracy is under threat. It's under direct attack um, in many parts of the world. And I think uh, something that's gotten way too little attention is the way in which, um, because not-for-profits and foundations are connected to governments and markets, um, we are the weakest link in a chain of attack. I, it's just, it, it just is. Um, the other links aren't very strong. Governments and um, um, commercial enterprises may not be any better than we are at securing our information, um, but we are really weak in it, and that, that's a problem. Um, and what is the responsibility of research evaluators, academics, um, to really think about security in this context? And I'm happy to come back and talk about some of my ideas on that. So that's a march, a run, a sprint through um, the framing. Let me jump ahead here. Next slide very quickly. Um, this is how the lab thinks about all of this uh, in that um, we see the need simultaneously for significant advances in these four domains in order for civil society to actually exist and there be some form of independence in the digital age. So this is what we need to all be working on. This is the kind of work we need to be paying attention to. I can. The good news is there's change happening in each of these domains. Um, and we can come back to this, but when we think about our own work at the lab, these are the four domains that we pay attention to. The one I haven't really spoken to here are norms. Um, I can talk about that. I'm talking basically about just the way everyday people interact with the same system, the same set of digital systems. This is the space the lab does the least on, um, but we pay attention to the people who are doing a lot of work on there. So that's all framing. Next slide, then, what we tried to do is um, actually provide some useful principles for organizations and people in civil society and philanthropy to think about their use of digitized data. So if you remember the definition I gave you at the front end of digital civil society, the voluntary use of private resources for public benefit in the digital age, from that definition, we've derived these four principles, permission, privacy, openness, and pluralism. And I mean directly from the definition. So if you go to the next slide, I'll talk about each of these a little bit. Um, and you're going to be frustrated with me. You're going to be annoyed because these do not give you a clear-cut checklist of data ethics. Like, this is what we should and should not do. And that's why I opened with the opening I did, is because I can't actually do that. So this is the best I can do. And you may not even agree with this. Um, so even though I've just said that the notice and consent system is broken, um, for most foundations and nonprofits, they're frankly, they have an advantage in that they're doing so little with data that that the reasons notice and consent don't work anymore don't apply so much here. And for, um, I guess, almost um, moral reasons, I still argue in this space, permission really matters. Because this is, a, for the most part, people's participation with philanthropy and in nonprofits, for the most part, this is becoming less and less true, but there's a degree of voluntariness here. We don't just, you know, go up to people on the street and take their money, and we don't just go up to people and, and take their time. We ask them. We sell ourselves to them. We ask for them to, to, to interact with us. And I don't see why, and actually we're quite good at it. We've built an entire industry on asking people's permission to, to, to donate to us. I think when it comes to digitized data, the same set of, um, the same energy and integrity should be applied. The biggest difference here for most organizations They've set up most of those practices where they've done them well um, toward the people whose money they want, not toward the people who to whom they're providing services. And when it comes to digitized data, the information that's most valuable 
is going to come from the people you're actually serving. So for foundations and nonprofits, really developing an ethos, an organizational ethos of asking permission for, uh, from the people they're serving to use, to collect and use their data is very doable and I think actually um, is a starting place that most organizations feel like they, they, they come to with some strength. So the first principle is to really think about permission. And it's not a small thing. It is not a small thing to do. Um, you may be familiar with Oxfam, which has um, published, and we've published one case study on them, but they've been, they actually redesigned their entire data collection processes, their entire data life cycle around the human rights principles that they purport to pursue in their overarching work. And it took them years to do it. It was an enormous organizational change. And when they did it, they also very wisely said, and we will revisit this entire thing every two years because the nature of the systems we'll be interacting with will have changed dramatically. Um, I think that's an important lesson for everybody. This isn't a checklist. You can't pick the box and move on. It's actually a way of working. So that's principle number one is permission. Uh, number two, next slide. Um, privacy, and here I mean um, it's tied to, again, kind of the mindset of foundations and nonprofits, and it's tied to that um, aspirational image of democracy I don't, I think not for profits and foundations are doing a whole ton of things with people's data just because they're acting like business, because they're habituated to behaving the way Facebook and Apple have habituated us to behaving, even though there's absolutely no reason for us to behave that way. And the minute you investigate your own practices, you start to realize that. So, for example, most organizations I'm familiar with think that the very best strategy is to collect as much data as possible. Even though they can't protect it, they have no capacity to use it, there's no planning for them to have any capacity to use it. They're, it's almost like they're sitting around hoping a data scientist is going to drop from the sky. But they don't even know what they'd have that data scientist do. So they're collecting all kinds of information on people that actually they're not, they're not doing it with any respect or integrity. They're not protecting it. It's just a huge liability. And they don't really know how to get themselves out of this morass. Um, the, the thing I usually ask people to think about when they, you know, is, is understand there's a whole life cycle to this information. And that the very best way you can respect the privacy, and by privacy I mean both the the actual sort of lived privacy of the person who's represented in your data set and also their private right to donate it to you is to not collect what you can't protect. And that runs counter to every message, every nonprofit and foundation and every one of us on the phone and every person in the, in the modern marketing economy has been subjected to for the last decade because we've been told and habituated for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the last at least 10 years, that more data is better. Up to a second. Yeah. In Berlin, and it's really great to talk with folks in the European Union because um, there's a lot of toing and froing, there's a lot of struggle, it feels like a lot of compliance, but there's also, I think, people are really beginning to question their own practices. Um, and that's a great example. Um, so that's, and another one actually that, that people on this phone call probably find themselves in all the time, back to the permission and the privacy together, is simply being asked for your permission to record the call, the mm -hmm. video, the speech, the fact that you're in the room. Um, you know, that, it's not a small thing. As a woman traveling the world, everybody's broadcasting of where I am in the world actually has implications for me. To yeah. say nothing of the fact that I actually appreciate being asked to sign the consent form and often cross out all kinds of things on it and I drive people crazy. So um, 
and now put yourself that's you know that's me privileged traveling lucy i'm talking about the the people in the community that your colleagues are serving they deserve the same respect um next principle next slide um and these really need to be thought of in relationship to each other the, this is the third of four and it has to do with openness and um by this i mean not the knee-jerk kind of, oh, open data, it's the solution to everything, but really thinking about we exist as foundations and nonprofits um, to make the world better in some way. None of us is going to do it by ourselves. What information can we share and how and with whom that might lead to collective change? And if you think about privacy, permission, and openness, together, you start to get at the kind of mindset that says, huh, if I want to actually share information at the end of the process, what kinds of permission do I need to have at the beginning of the process? And what kind of systems do I need in place throughout the process to make sure I'm treating this resource safely, ethically, and effectively, or respectfully? I'm managing, I'm governing this data with an eye toward the fact that somebody donated it to me and I'm going to tell the world something at the end. And that uh, three-step process is, I think, uh, the, a helpful mindset to get into as a researcher, as a, as a foundation executive, as a nonprofit manager, as someone running a not-for-profit or an association. There's one more, and then I'm going to stop talking. Um, the fourth principle, next slide, is about pluralism. And there's a couple of different meanings to this. Um, if you remember, I said that lab thinks about tech, orgs, laws, and norms. When I think about pluralism and why it matters here so much, um, first and foremost, it matters in terms of voice. It matters in terms of recognizing that as an organization, you're collecting data from a diverse group of people, that data can, if you're collecting it from people about people, it's sensitive, it's personal, it's PII, whatever, it, that it is. It, it's, I also say to people, replace the word data with person and now go through all your policies. Point number one, those people from whom you're collecting that information and using it to make a change in the world ought to have a say in how that is done and how that is used. So we need representative, more diverse, more inclusive, more equitable uh, voices at our tables as we're making our decisions about the data processes because it's data about people, point number one. Point number two, there's a technological implication to pluralism. Any not-for-profit organization or foundation or association that is um, dependent on a single commercial vendor for any particular part of what they do, so if you're dependent on and, and not just a single vendor, but it's not, there's so few choices in many cases, but you know, if you're dependent on Google for all of your document sharing, you're vulnerable to Google's business model. If you're dependent on Facebook for your entire existence, and there are an awful lot of not-for-profit, there are an awful lot of civil society actors who are, you're really vulnerable to Mark Zuckerberg's, you know, mood switches. Uh, that was a joke. You're vulnerable to their business model changes. Um, if you're independent on a single software company for your CRM, you're dependent on their business model and how are you actually taking that into account. So there's a tech part of pluralism that's really complicated, um, but it, it needs to be addressed um, as you think about what makes for an effective organization. Um, and there are... Um, policy implications to pluralism. Net neutrality or broadband access as policy issues are ultimately about participation and, and inclusion in the democratic life or the commercial life of modern communities. And 
I don't know a single civil society organization or foundation that at some point that isn't part of what they care about. Yet it's remarkable to me how uninvolved civil society and philanthropy have been in these digital policies. Um, and I'm working hard to change that. So that that's another meaning of pluralism. So those are the four principles. Permission, privacy, openness, pluralism. I cannot give you an ethical checklist, but that's that's where we come at it. Next slide, just in case you're not familiar with some of these resources. These are there's not a comprehensive list, but some other communities. Some uh, the first one is an online community of uh, not for profit and foundation. You, it's usually think of it this is the collection of accidental techies, if you will. These are the collection of accidental data people. There's 1,500 or so of them. It's a listserv. They do remarkable things. They're the ones who drew attention to the World Food Program in Palantir. They're the ones who brought it to the newspaper's attention. Um, but they do a lot of other things, and they're a wonderful resource to ask questions of. Ten Simple Rules for Responsible Big Data Research is a very easy to read, publicly accessible article written from the point of um, uh, sort of a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens on this, or at least very much an equity lens on getting big data, so an important set of things to ask yourself. Merrill Tech is a community, uh, it's about, um, oh God, I just forgot what it stands for, but it's evaluation, research, and learning, and I think the M is about machines. So it's really looking at tech. Uh, or no, it's monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning, and the use of technology in it. It's very much focused on the development sphere, but a lot to learn from them. And then um, the Center for Responsible Data looks at um, this in uh, human rights and human humanitarian um, domains. Uh, also a lot of inform it, 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 useful information there. 